Hey, great. So hi, everyone, and welcome to the Foreman Community Demo. I'm a farm and active developer within the Foreman project, and I'll be hosting the demo today. Um, before we get started, uh, I want to remind you that you can always ask us questions um, here in the Google chat and also on metrics. Um, yeah, I guess we can move on to our agenda. Uh, so we have three regular demos three regular demos and then one use case demo on the form and Antible plugin. Uh, so I'll share a quick update from the community and then we can move on to our demo. And uh, yeah, so the first update uh, is regarding the form 3.11 release schedule. Uh, so currently we are in the preparation week of the current uh, form and release and stabilization week will begin next week. Uh, followed by the branching process the week after, uh, which is two weeks from now. Uh, so we are hoping to get everything done by the end of the month and then start with uh, the actual um, um, the actual well, uh, version. Forgot how we call it. Uh, okay. Next um, update from the community is regarding the foreign birthday event. Uh, it will be in um, on Monday, in July 15th uh, of this year, 2024. And actually, I would like to share um, the post that Bernard from Epics has shared with us. Yeah, okay, she's visible, great. Um, so the, we are very excited uh, to announce that after many years, we we're finally doing the birthday event uh, in person. I can't say it again. Uh, and we invite everyone. So please make sure if you want to attend, uh, you need to register uh, to let them know in advance. And I think that's it. Uh, you can find the post uh, in the agenda, the demo, if you want more details. Okay, great. Uh, that's it. Yeah, we can move on to our next demo, uh, which is by Ian. Uh, yeah, Ian is here. Great. So, container push beginner beginning. Uh, so, Ian, yeah, whenever you're ready. Great. Thanks, Nafar. Get my screen shared. All righty. Cool. Sharing my screen now. Um, so uh, I'm just going to give a little preview today about um, our new feature of being able to push containers up to Catello. Um, so this feature is going to be partially available in Catello 4.13 and is aimed to be fully functional in Catello 4.14. Um, previously, before pulp three came around, you were able to like upload manifests, and that was kind of our interim solution for people adding their own custom stuff without having a container registry. Um, and we, there was an attempt some years ago to do container push with pulp two, but I don't think it got fully working. Anyway, now we're finally adding it. So um, I'll just show you what we have currently. So in its current state. Um, you're able to push container images to pulp, and pulp will take them in, and that's pretty much it. It's mid-development, so you won't see anything in the UI quite yet. Um, one of our other developers, Quinn, is going to have a pull request out soon to finish that part. So let's just let me just show you uh, what you can do so far. And actually, I won't demo it here, but there is one line of code you can comment out. And if you do that, you're actually able to pull these images as well. Um, but that's a, a secret that no one will have to deal with because it should be <laughs> functional in uh, 4.13. So if you have some container images, let's do a podman uh, image ls. So I have a couple images here. I've got a curl one. I have this Ariana one. And one I actually pulled previously that was synced in Catello, you can tell because it has this insanely long name, as we tend to have. Um, so let's say you want to push this up. Uh, I think I 
with how the name is, I'm pretty sure I sync this directly from Quay. Um, so if you want to push an image, I already, let's just check that I logged in. Beautiful. So we could do a podman push, and then we'll give it the image ID, and then you'll give it the uh, FQDN of your server. Now, we are implementing some special naming rules because in Foreman, we have organizations, we have products, and that doesn't, of course, entirely exist in Podman, however, or sorry, in the container uh, ecosystem, but there is this idea of namespacing. And what's great is that the names are separated by slashes. So we have some ideas here for how we're doing the naming. Um, and our, the plan as is, is right now you'll do something like default organization. So this is going to be based on label. And then your product. And then the repository name. So like curl or whatever. And this should make it easy for folks. The important thing is, currently, we have that whole naming scheme. We want to make sure that what you push to, you can also pull from. So that naming scheme, the special Catello container naming scheme, is totally disabled for push. Um, and so you'll be able to push this and then pull it with the same name. Now, there's one caveat. Um, <laughs> if if uh, your organization does this, I'll be surprised. However, imagine you have a default organization with um, now, labels, actually, I should back up. Labels in uh, Catello, Foreman, for organizations, are cap sensitive. So you might have a default organization that's like of multiple cases and then another one with the same name. I really hope you don't do that. But if you do, we will also have a mode where you can prefix, have this ID prefix. And then instead of giving the, like, the labels, you can give the IDs. But that'll be for you know the 1% of folks who actually have that. So for the rest of you, let's uh, just forget I ever said that um, and keep going. So if you push this, uh, you'll see this nice stuff from Podman. And you can see that it got pushed through. Now, you won't see it in Catello yet because we don't have that set up. However, but we can poke around in pulp. So let's, do, uh, let's use the pulp CLI here that we have set up. So we'll do a sudo pulp container repository. Now we have to, because it's a new repository type, it's called the push type. So we have to do dash t push list. And we see we have our repo here. Um, it has the name default organization slash my product slash curl. So that's exactly where you'll be able to pull it from. And what's cool is that in pulp, um, a distribution gets automatically created for these special push repositories. So we can do, likewise, we can do a pulp container uh, distribution list. And then we'll see our distribution that got created. So the important thing is this registry path. So this is, you could copy and paste this and pull directly from it. So we have my FQDN here, default organization, my product, and then curl. What's very nice is that to, to the container ecosystem, this is just the name of the container. Um, but Pulp also ends up creating a namespace uh, for the stuff that precedes curl. Um, and yeah, now I can't pull this right now because as our code is, it's trying to protect these repositories. But because it doesn't exist in our database, it'll just throw a 404. Um, but I said before, you could actually comment out uh, the line that does that checking, and you would be able to pull this directly from Pulp, which is nice. So yeah, that's more or less it. Uh, the next time we do this demo, might be me, might be Quinn, but we'll have uh, more to show. We'll, you'll actually be able to pull the content, and you'll be able to uh, see it in your list of repositories. But yeah, that's it for me. Let me know if there are any questions. Thank you, Ian. Um, I guess no more questions, but yeah, maybe later. And next one is Samir. Uh, Samir is here. Great. So container manifest label and migration by Samir. And uh, whenever you're ready. Hey, Nofar, can I go after the next demo? Uh, like next person? Sure, yeah. Let's, like, so. let's try it. Let's see if Alasa is prepared. Um, 
are supposed to talk about a remediation, remediation wizard? Yep, sure. That is great. So I guess the browser is visible, right? Yep. Um, well, hello. Uh, today I'm going to show you uh, the latest feature we have added to the Foreman OpenScape plugin, which is uh, Remediation Wizard. Uh, just to refresh the background for that, um, currently uh, you, of course, you have um, compliance reports. So currently, um, if you want to remediate one of the failed uh, rules uh, uh, of this uh, report, you would need to go to the full report, um, find the failed rule, and uh, check what uh, uh, what options are for remediation of the problem. Um, then you would go select one of these, copy and uh, copy paste the solution into, let's say, a remote job and run it manually, or just uh, create a different solution for your own as well. Um, in both cases, you would do it manually, and you would need to go through um, all the rules again manually. Um, but uh, now, um, we have added remediation wizard, we should help with that and automate uh, things for you. Um, Let's uh, let's show you just one of the easiest examples, just for the sake of the demo. Um, so I have this rule uh, on this host, um, which is let's say carry, um, and I have this failed rule, um, which is telling that my host should uh, have aid package uh, installed and configured. Um, so here in the Actions drop down. You have now um, remediation button, which will invoke the uh, whole wizard. Um, first of all, you would uh, need to uh, select the method you want to remediate with. Of course, uh, remote job makes sense to automate things, but again, just to be able to see other options, uh, so you don't need to go to the full report. You can observe them just here. So, uh, for example, let's say the same rule, uh, install AD. Um, here, here are some um, snippets and all of, uh, snippets and scripts and all of that, and you can observe it right here as well. Um, nothing much, but pretty useful. Um, so let's get back to our primal action, which is uh, configuring remote job. Here we um, support if the fix itself or the um, rule contains uh, any snippets, we will show them here. Uh, currently we support on the shell and Ansible. Um, so let's pick the Ansible one. And as the next step, you will see an error because it's demo, of course. Um, Okay. Yep, as always. And um, sorry, why, why do I have an error? For unknown reason, but let's assume simple reload will fix things. Oh, of course, I was logged out. Makes sense. Sorry about that. I'm never lucky with demos. But uh, just since we're waiting for that, um, yep, session time out, session times out. Um, anyway, what I wanted to show you is that after we selected the uh, job and, uh, well, the provider for the job, um, we then will see a list of hosts we can um, choose from to run remediation on. Um, of course, by default, you will uh, want to run um, remediation for this particular particular uh, rule for this particular host, but you are not limited uh, by that. 
the remediation so the remediation wizard support, supports also other hosts which fail this rule uh, they should be fetched automatically and presented as a list um just one second the loads uh, the report is quite huge um but anyway uh, you could select other hosts from the rule from the list sorry i will show you again and the and the um, and uh, job will be run um, for other hosts as well so let's say this one of course you will have more hosts so you can uh, select all them um, and run uh, through uh, run the job through all the failed hosts and as a last step um you can review what will be actually applied so you're sure what are you what you are doing um also you can view other as a of a helpful information about the problem but um that's pretty all then you click run uh, the remote job will be created against the hosts um, you can see job details here it will redirect you to the job itself and um, no. so it's running now after it's completed um, the report itself won't be updated until the next automatical run of scap uh, scanning and i guess that's pretty much it Thank you, Alex. Yeah. Okay, Mark, go ahead. Well, first of all, uh, thanks, Alex, for showing this and for the feature. I think this is one of the one of long-awaited ones. I think since like Foreman 1.8, uh, when we had remote execution plugin and OpenSCAP plugin, people really asked for this. Now, years later, we have it, um, which is great. I, I I really like it. My question is. Um, if I have multiple failing rules, can I trigger the remediation uh, in the same run for multiple uh, of the rules? I don't think this is being tested by people who write these things, uh, like these remediation scripts, but I wonder, can we actually do it from our UI or not? Or from, from our application? Uh, thank you for the question. Um, currently, we don't support, uh, let's say, many to many um, relation in terms of uh, a rule remediation um so in other words we support only uh, one rule per run um, you can remediate think... on multiple hosts but only one rule yeah that actually makes sense to me I, I think that people usually don't start with let's say 80 uh failing rules like we did we do here they probably start with the with the security environment and there may be some things that they they need to fix but okay makes sense one more one more thing i saw the warning like the, the red uh, banner saying don't try or don't remediate on production environment before testing it in non-production environment first um, from the past i know that the recommendation was don't use the red color and exclamation mark for things that are not errors and this is not an error this is this is a warning because the first impression it leaves and i felt that immediately when i saw that is that oh something is broken maybe you need to log in again so maybe a yellow color with uh, with something like that would, would be better. Yeah, we've considered that. Uh, and it was mostly inspired by uh, our documentation of, um, of uh, all the information related to uh, scap scannings and remediation. So um, you, you will see the same, um, let's say, banner across our application and uh, documentation as well. Okay. Cool. Just for consistency. Okay, I guess no more questions. Uh, so Sami, can we continue with you? Uh, yes, let me try presenting my screen here. Let me know if you can see my screen, okay. Yeah, we can see our screen. 
Thanks. Awesome. All right. So today I have two things on my agenda here. So the first one is around some updates on adding metadata to container manifests. And the other one is a feature called content repair, which is also called verify checksum uh, for smart proxies. So let me get started with the first one. So uh, I have an example uh, image pulled up here, which is uh, bootable CentOS. So if you go to K and you see this uh, CentOS image, for example, it has a bunch of tags and it has a section called labels. So these are basically key value pairs and these contain some metadata information about the manifest. Uh, these fields are now being indexed uh, and brought down in pulp. And we are introducing that same feature with uh, Ketalo 413. Uh, so some new fields here are annotations, labels. So both of these are key value pairs, uh, annotations and labels. And we have two Boolean fields. One is for bootable containers. So there's a flag is bootable. And then in process to support Flatpak in the future in Ketalo. So we have another field called is Flatpak. So these are the fields. So one thing about this is uh, manifest that you had in your system before the 413 upgrade will need to run a specific pulp task, which is called handle container image data. And that will be added to form and maintain. So if you're using form and maintain, that pull request is still in progress. But we have a new task here, uh, container handle image metadata. This will be added to uh, post upgrade tasks. So if you use form and maintain for your upgrades, then that should work or uh, you could run this manually after the upgrade. Uh, there's another task. So once uh, you have this, so on 4.13, if you uh, index and sync new container uh, repos, you'll get these fields for existing repositories. You'll need to run that pulp upgrade task. And there is another thing in the works, which is a Ketelo rake task, which you'll need to run to populate this information for older data. So this is in two parts. Uh, we will have more details around this as our uh, PRs start getting merged, and we'll go with the upgrade flow once we uh, get to 413. OK, so this was one part, and the other uh, agenda on my demo was some new tasks we have added. So let me go with some background there. So for our repositories, I'll use the same repository. Uh, we have always had this action, which is called verify content checksum. So let me run this and see the task on the UI. So you'll see this task. It has this progress presenter. It's identifying corrupted units. It's identifying any missing units, and then it's trying to repair it. So we have had this uh, task on the main uh, Foreman server, on the main pulp, but we did not have this task for uh, smart proxies. So we have added that capability now, but it does not live on the UI, because this is not something we want users to be running too often. But the support is on the API and handle. So let me uh, show you how that looks like. So the uh, command here lives under capsule content. It's called verify checksum. And let me see the help for this. And let me go over the uh, setup here. So I have a smart proxy here. Let me go with this. I can look at the content. So here I have this smart proxy, which is tied to library environment. And we have a couple of content views here. And these content views can have as many repositories as in the content view. Uh, so we have this task here, which is verify checksum. It takes uh, certain parameters. 
which are optional. Uh, so you can target your repair task to a particular content view associated to the uh, smart proxy. You can target it at a particular environment. You can target it at a particular repository if you have identified a corrupted repository which has the corrupted artifact. Or you can run a global repair task if you do not provide any of these parameters. So that would look something like this. Uh, so if you're trying to run a global repair task on the entire smart proxy, you just provide the ID of the smart proxy. So in my case, it's ID2. So let's check that out. That will trigger a task. And let's go look at that task on the UI. So this will show up on the tasks page as this action, verify checksum for content on smart proxy. Uh, you can look at the time flow task. You see three subtasks or three run phases here, one for each repository. So this is a global repair task. So this will perform this action on all of the repositories on the smart proxy. And Similarly, if you wanted to narrow it down to a particular content view, uh, who in this case, so that task would run only for the specific uh, content view. So we have these options that are passed to the task, so you can narrow it down and you can uh, shorten the runtime. So in case of, uh, you have a big smart proxy, a global repair might not be the best thing for you because that might take a long time. So you can target specific repositories, content views, et cetera. A uh, couple more additions here. We have also added uh, the same uh, task of verifying checksum to content view versions. This was not available earlier. So, but now you can uh, run this repair task on content view versions that are published on the main pulp, uh, main form and server itself. So this is uh, something you can use if you have identified the exact repository in the exact content view that is not working for you. And yeah, that's about it for me. Great, right, thank you, Samir. Any questions? I guess no. So I will share my entire screen. We can move on to our last demo for today. Okay, great. So this is a popular use case demo uh, about configuration of host using uh, Azure Rules. Uh, last uh, popular use case demo was by Adam about the remote execution plugin and um, I guess this is related to the previous one and also to the first one about host registration. So I guess let's get started and um, we'll talk about everything. Uh, okay, so first of all, a short introduction. Um, I am the foreman Ansible plugin maintainer. Uh, so if you decide to contribute, I'm the person who you should you know, reach out to. Um, I'll be more than happy to help out with everything and discuss any suggestion or feature you would like to talk about. Um, so short agenda, we'll talk about intro, then what you need in order to use the plugin, then a, a demo and a last discussion. Um, okay, so let's just say the obvious, uh, what is form and what is Ansible? So form and obviously, uh, I hope everyone knows it's a life cycle management tool. Uh, you can do basically everything regarding uh, host management, uh, starting with provisioning and then the whole configuration process and monitoring um, with many, many other features we want to cover <laughs> this time. And Ansible is a popular open source tool that provides automation, configuration management, and orchestration all in one. Um, Naturally, they're both working very well together and makes a lot of sense to use them both. Um, so the form and Ansible plugin. 
um, there is a seamless integration between both of them. Uh, what you can do, you can leverage the Ansible playbook uh, features and roles uh, within Foreman. And um, one big feature we'll talk about is the fact that we are using the remote execution plugin to run the Ansible playbook, which gives us a lot of flexibility and um, better performance uh, while running uh, Ansible within Foreman. Um, so let's talk a little bit of why should you use the Foreman Ansible plugin. So one main reason is the unified interface. Um, so if you are already using Foreman to manage your host, um, I guess this makes a lot of sense to do everything uh, within the same platform. Um, also streamlined workflow. So that means that you can leverage Foreman's powerful uh, provision capabilities and all the configuration you can do within Foreman. Um, what if you're using um, Ansible automation features together with um, with Foreman. So it can save you a lot of time and uh, all of us like to use one, I guess one tool and not um, start using different tools. Uh, it can just save us a lot of time. Um, so you can run a Foreman Ansible plugin uh, via GUI. We have API, we also have a CLI. Uh, which I will demonstrate later. And I will also like to mention that, well, obviously because this plugin exists for uh, for a long time, you also have uh, the form and Ansible modules, which we cover in a different uh, deep dive, not for now, but I would just like to mention that you have a very big collection of Ansible modules there um, that are specifically designed to interact with uh, the form and API. Uh, so you can use this module, for example, to automate various tasks within Foreman. And um, for example, uh, you can automate uh, providing host, managing host configuration, and uh, managing Foreman resources. Like, um, let's see, sorry, uh, like networking settings, uh, partitions, and package uh, installation. Um, so. I know we have a lot of things to cover, like why should users uh, use the form and Ansible. Uh, this is just one of them. And I think just the, the best way to, to demonstrate it is by showing you a demo. And um, so before that, uh, I would like to cover what do you need in order to use the form and Ansible plugin. So obviously, yeah, you need to install uh, Ansible. And also, you need the form and remote execution, as we mentioned before, and smart proxy. I will talk about it a little bit later. And how the magic happens is uh, by using the Ansible runner. And there's also uh, something optional called uh, the Ansible callback plugin. Um, so let's talk a little bit about everything here. So um, Ansible requires the remote execution plugin, uh, which requires the smart proxy. Um, so that means that you would need to register the smart, the smart proxy on Foreman. And then if we, you would like to uh, use this specific smart proxy, then you would have to add the SSH key to, uh, to the authorized key uh, on the managed host. So the user will be able to run the remote execution command. Uh, I guess in the demo it will be clear if it's not now. Um, and Foreman will relies on the Foreman remote execution in order to be able to run playbooks remotely. Uh, so each time you run a playbook on Ansible module, a uh, Foreman will receive facts and report uh, for the host that you have executed it on. Um, so that's one feature uh, we're using. And uh, let's just mention that the Ansible runner is a tool, uh, if you are not uh, familiar with it. And it's very powerful because it provides you a way to run uh, Ansible playbook role and other tasks from a command line interface. That's why it's important for that we're using it. And it provides uh, several benefits over the standard uh, Ansible playbook commands, including it has better performance and greater control over execution and improved error handling. That's why we are using it. Um, I guess that's it about the um, 
the callback plugin is just a, a plugin that allows you to customize the way that Ansible reports uh, on the progress and the results of a uh, playbook run. Um, so Ansible basically includes a number of built-in callback plugins, uh, but you can create your own callback if you want to customize it yourself. Uh, I guess that's it for this. Um, some key features will, which we will talk about, uh, the Ansible rules, variables, playbook supports, and um, et cetera. Yeah, I guess uh, we'll start with a demo. Um, let's see what you have here. Um, before I forget, this is the documentation. Um, I used it in, uh, to well decide what I'm going to cover in the demo. Um, you basically have everything here. Uh, so feel free to go over it. I think uh, it includes a lot more things than what I can do in the short time that I have. Um, and the Ansible modules, which we talked about, great. So uh, for the demo today, I will use two hosts. Um, the first one, I'm, I apologize for the weird names, uh, the change SSH key and the rel uh, nine, the fine new machine. Uh, so let's start with the first one. Just two machines I have on my foreman. Um, here under the Ansible tab, I can edit the Ansible rules. Right now, I only have one role, and uh, I'm going to show um, the simplest um, Ansible rules run. So I executed the Ansible rules, and here in the recent jobs under running, the running, I can find the job. Let's see, just to make sure it works. Wait, it works, and I can see the report to see the output of the recent job. It's very simple, just a ping task. Nothing to see here, just wanted to make sure it works. Great. Um, and let's see, don't want to forget anything. Okay, let's add one more row. And I will choose the print file row. Let's see where they have it. This one. Oh. Okay, and let's, oh, yeah, we can use them both. The pink varrow, uh, print varrow and pink row. Okay, I will confirm. And now I have two rows. I would like to run again. I'm using the GUI because um, it's just more visible, but I can, I guess I'll show the hammer command uh, in the end of the demo too. Okay, uh, so this time I have an error. Let's see why. So probably the first one uh, with the ping, well, I, we already saw it working, so it should be the second one. And I can see here the message saying that there is an undefined uh, variable named var uh, dash test. Yeah, okay, I have an error <laughs> with the spelling, but um, this is the name of the variable that I'm missing. So, okay, uh, let's try to solve it. So I will go to configure and then Ansible and variable. Let's see uh, if I can find this variable here. And yeah, I see it does not exist and probably also does not exist in the Ansible rule. Uh, so I will create a new Ansible variable and I will name it that way. And I need to choose the role to assign it to. So what's Print something, yep, no, have to print, print bar roll. Okay, that's great, let's override it. And we'll have to see then my value and let's give it uh, me, okay. Actually, I can also print the date, but let's give it that way. Okay, yeah, let's click on submit. Great, and I will try to rerun um, the job again and refresh it and let's open the results okay great i have success good news let's see and under print for role i can see that the message is the actual value i just gave to my role okay that's great um, so we have an error. We covered how to add variables. 
Um, let's do it this time with a matcher. And let's use another um, another Ansible rule to do that. So let me just go quickly and log in into that uh, host. Okay, this is the change SSH key, and I will zoom in a little bit. Um, yeah. Using Vagrant uh, to up to for this um, machine, and yeah, okay. I have a few messages here, but I would like to add one more message um, to the MOTD file. So where is my host? Right here. Okay, again, Ansible. I have a role here. And I will share. I will show you what it does. The M uh, MOTD uh, role. And if I will go here, I have it prepared. So hopefully you can see this is the list of roles that I have. But here the last command I printed uh, the output of the the role itself. So you can see what it does. Just add um, another line to the MOT uh, uh, file, and the line is well, it's the variable um, value. So let's go back. To Go back to format, and here you can see that the this Ansible role actually has a value. So I will click on it to see what is this value. Click on it again, and hopefully you can see uh, the string is "Welcome to our server. Enjoy your stay." Okay, so <laughs> this should be the end message um, that will be added. Okay, let's run the Ansible all. Okay, so I want to see success, and also I want to see that this file was actually modified. So it's going to the output. Okay, and great, I can see that this this role um, has modified uh, the 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 MOTD file. Um, and if I will try to log in again, I would expect to see this line. So yeah, welcome to our server in Jersey. That's a new line. And uh, great, okay, I guess everything works. Good news, and uh, I want to do, um, I won't do it, but I would like to show you that if I go to Ansible, let's see, here under the variables, I can see um, the value, for example, for this. And let's see, maybe I need to refresh it. I was expecting to also see um, this, variable here okay so in order to do that i need to click on override and then i need to override it so do a new message submit and now i'm expecting to see it here okay yeah and i have it here and this the source attribute is the default value and I can change it if I want another message. Um, so let's um, server name, for example, this one. And now if I will run it again, um, I should see the new, okay, yeah, you know what, let's do it. It's relatively quick. Let's see if it works. Um, on the running, I need to start closing my tab. Okay, great success. Let's see, the file was actually modified. Okay, great. Now I need to close connection and SSH again. Yeah, server name, change SSH key. Just a simple um, example. Obviously, you can do so much more. You can play with the variables and adjust it accordingly to each host. Um, Okay, let's see what else I want to show you. Um, okay, let's go quickly over the job template. Um, do it from here and also, so here under commands, there are different commands um, you can run. Uh, I think the easiest way to see it is to see the actual template, but I guess like individual. Uh, so if I go to job templates, let's see this tab. Close and I will search for Ansible. I can see all the job 
templates related to Ansible that I can uh, run on my servers. Uh, so Ansible collection, for example, I can install collections from the Galaxy. Uh, this is the default um, playbook that we're using to run uh, Ansible roles on host. Uh, also, you can install uh, as well from Galaxy, from Git, and see so much more. Um, I guess the best way is just to go uh, in each one and just to see the output of it. Uh, this, this, for example. And uh, next thing I wanted to show is the settings. We also have the, uh, settings specific for um, the form and Ansible plugin. So if we go to settings and then under the Ansible tab, we can see a list of settings. It's just one way to set it. Uh, for example, the default verbosity level here, I'm, I'm using the default. Uh, I can disable it or I can well, change it accordingly to my needs. Um, let's see, what else? Oh, yeah, uh, I guess we have more, a little bit more time. So I will quickly show you examples of how I can also do the same from Hammer. Um, so let's list the role, uh, all the other roles that we currently have. Uh, okay, great. I can see I have 50 roles. And if I want to see uh, the list of roles of a specific host, this time my host is the change SSH key. And I can see it has three roles, which we, um, we saw previously. Uh, what else? Let's see. I want to add a role to this specific host. Uh, let's say I want to add this create temp test file role. I will use, no, sorry. I will use this command. Um, okay. So I have uh, the hammer and then host as role. I'm adding just one role. Uh, the ID is two and the name of the host and I see as role has being associated. That's great. Let's make sure it works. So I will list the Ansible rules again, and I'm expect, expecting to see yeah uh, this new role listed. And let's do one last comment to delete uh, this role I just added. So this time it will be a remove instead of add. And then um, the arguments are the same. Ansible rule has been disassociated. That's great. Let's make sure. Yeah, that's great. I have only one A3 role. Um, yeah, there are other things you can do. Let's, uh, you can list uh, all your sub commands here and um, have like a better description of them. I guess that's it. Let's see. I will go back to the um to the presentation yeah i wanted to make sure i covered everything um okay so yeah that's it and uh, we have some time for questions or suggestions issues improvements and uh, this is your time to share oh wow for, that's clear okay uh, yeah. I say, uh no just thanks for the uh the demo here i was wondering do you think it would make sense to like cut this out and stick it on YouTube as like a, a user demo or something. So it's outside of the community demo. It might make it easier for people to find. Yeah, definitely. Um, the thing is that you need like a video editor for that. And um, I did it once. I just need to um, remind myself how to do it again. But definitely, I wanted to create a, play a playlist with all the um, use case demos. So thank you for reminding me that. Um, will do. Yeah, that's, that's important. Sure, no problem. I do video editing sometimes for my demos, so I can okay. help with that <laughs> if you want. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I will reach out if I can find you know easily um, my old ways <laughs> how I did it in the past. Thank you. Sounds good. Yeah. Any more questions? Yeah. Thanks so far for the demo. I I have one. Um, so you mentioned that. Ansible relies on the remote execution. And I think in one of the past use case demos, we have seen that remote execution has the ability to schedule the run to either specific time or even like recurring execution. So can I do that with, with the Ansible runs as well somehow? 
Yeah, definitely. I obviously didn't go over all the features we have. Um, and I knew I was forgetting sure. a lot of things. Uh, but yeah, if you want, oh, I'm sorry. You can definitely do that. I will, I can show you from the UI if I will remember how to do it. So schedule a job. Um, and let's say I want to run a Ansible command. Oh, let's say I want to run Ansible command. Uh, oh, no, it's actually to make it easier. If I will just use the default. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, as well host and default. This is how we uh, run as well host. I host and schedule. Um, so, well, I didn't go through the, all the uh, the fields you can fill in here. Uh, but for example, there's a state user. It's more related to remote execution, but obviously you can use this feature also for Ansible because the way we um, we uh, promote perform this action of uh, running an uh, Ansible job on a host using the SSH. Uh, so here, under a schedule, you can decide if you want features, execution, for example, or recurring execution. Oh, yeah, sure. OK, now no, that makes perfect sense. Mm -hmm. okay. I do remember there is another way to do that, but just skip my mind. Maybe if you go to the host detail page, uh, there is also a sub tab called jobs. I think maybe there is some scheduling. Maybe I'm missing. Uh, if you go to the Ansible tab here. Oh, right. Thank you. Yeah, jobs here. So schedule a recurring job. Yeah. <laughs> oh, nice. Thank you. Yeah, forgot where to find it. Okay. Yeah, any more questions? Okay, I guess not. So we can uh, go back to the demo. And I would just like to mention that the next demo is as usual in three weeks on uh, 30 of May. And we hope to see everyone there. And thanks everyone for the great demos and also for coming to see for the participation. So thank you. Thanks everyone. And thanks Nafar as well. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Have a great rest of the day. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.